Hello, welcome to our service of Holy Communion from St James's Church here in Rowledge. My name's Russ Gant and I'm the vicar here and it's wonderful to be able to welcome you to this online service. Today is Palm Sunday, the day when the church reflects on Jesus entering into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, uh, was hailed as King of the Jews and people laid down palm branches and their cloaks in front of him. And as we journey through Holy Week, we remember how fickle people can be and how quickly our praises can turn to the shouts of crucify him. You might like to have bread and wine ready in your homes so that you can join us in this simple meal of bread and wine as we remember all that Christ has done for us. So let's be still for a few moments. Hosanna to the Son of David, the King of Israel. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God our Saviour, whose Son Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem as Messiah to suffer and to die. Let these palms be to us a sign of his victory and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our king and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And so we're going to sing together our opening hymn.
and so we say together the prayer of preparation. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And so we bring before God all those things for which we would ask for his forgiveness, knowing that his forgiveness is there ready to be received by us. We pray together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with heartfelt repentance and true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And a collect for this Palm Sunday. True and humble King, hailed by the crowd as Messiah, grant us the faith to know you and to love you, that we may be found beside you on the way of the cross, which is the path of glory. Amen. Karen's going to bring our Bible reading to us this morning. Today's reading is taken from Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this, say, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. It was the Labour Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, who once famously said, a week is a long time in politics. I think we could apply the same reflection to this week between Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. Just imagine the contrasts from entering the city amidst wild shouts and celebrations of the Messiah is come and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord to only a matter of days to dragging his cross outside of the same city to the hill of execution from being hailed as king and prophet to being condemned as a criminal. The importance of Palm Sunday is reflected in the fact that it's one of the very few stories mentioned in all four of the Gospels. All four Gospels have the passion, narrative, the trial, uh, death and resurrection of Jesus. But in addition to that, there are very few stories in all four. There's the account of John the Baptist, and Jesus at the Jordan, the feeding of the 5,000, 
and Palm Sunday. So it's so important that it impacted all four writers to want to record it. And as I reflect with you today on the significance of Palm Sunday, I want to just draw out three basic themes. The first one is, this event was planned a long time ago. Secondly, the prime focus for Jesus was not to enjoy the celebrations of the crowd or the prophecies about his messiahship, but it was to renew the temple of the living God. And thirdly, it was a wake-up call for the city and community. He had come to do business with Jerusalem. And I'm pointing these three things out because I think all too often we can telescope a Palm Sunday, an Easter Sunday into almost one event and don't appreciate the full significance of Palm Sunday. I think it's time to give it its full colour and I hope to do that with you. Let's look at that first thing. Palm Sunday was planned a long time ago. According to Luke's Gospel, chapter 9 and verse 51, it says this. As the time approached for Jesus to be taken up to heaven, he resolutely set out for Jerusalem. That's the New International version of the event. He resolutely determined time now to go to Jerusalem. Not just time now to go and have my date with the cross. There's much more to it than this. The message translation says he steeled himself for this journey. The New American version says he resolutely determined that he was going to go to Jerusalem now. No distractions, no detours. En route, yes, there are teachings and there are healings, but he set his face towards Jerusalem. I think it's the King James Version that translates it as that too. And the Greek word behind that is prosopon, which is the natural Greek word for face and facing things. There's the prearranged signal of the donkey and cult. When they say, what are you doing with taking my donkey and cult away? Say the master needs it. Right enough. We don't know how long before Jesus prearranged this. In fact, if you look at all four Gospels, only John puts him in Jerusalem earlier. Jesus largely spends his ministry on the road or up in Galilee. But sometime earlier he planned this. He staged it well. Time to go to Jerusalem now. And if you want to really step back and look at it from a long-term perspective, then you could take the words of Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4 that talked about Christ being the Lamb of God slain from before the foundation of the world. Isn't that amazing? Even before creation, even before the fall, even before rebellions galore and revivals amazing, he's the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. God foresees, of course, human activity and reconfigures his plans accordingly. Why? Because he's so determined to love us and save us and bring us into a quality relationship with himself. Palm Sunday, it wasn't planned a week ago. It was planned a very long time before it actually happened. And some signal inside of Jesus my date is coming, and it's got to happen in Jerusalem. If you think about it, and I hope this doesn't sound too ridiculous, but nothing would have altered if Jesus had been executed by the Roman soldiers in Bethlehem, in Nazareth, in some other town. It's the death of Christ, not the location of the death of Christ, that's the significant thing. So why Jerusalem? Well, it's the capital, of course. But it speaks other things. That brings us to the next two items. Secondly, in our three things, the prime focus for Palm Sunday for Jesus was to heal and renew the ministry in the temple. As I said earlier, we all too often leap from Palm Sunday to the arrest, to the trial, to the conviction, to the execution, and then that glorious resurrection. 
on Easter Sunday morning. We telescope the events into one event. And I think all four Gospels are saying to us, pause a moment. See what he actually does on Palm Sunday. Is it just a prelude to Easter Sunday? Is it just Jesus giving a wee signal for starting Holy Week, folks? Lent is almost over. Or is the purpose in everything he does? And I think one of the prime purposes for Jesus is to challenge the faith community to be renewed in his image. The temple that day may be church in our day. What's the first thing he does when he hits the city? Gets actually inside the walls of the city. All the Gospels tell us he heads straight for the temple. He does not hang about. He doesn't have a conversation with donkey owners. He doesn't chat people up. He doesn't do miracles. He doesn't preach. All that may come later. Straight to the temple. I have business in God's house. And of course, we all know what happens. There are money changers uh, who are more interested in extorting money from people in order to uh, provide those people with the opportunity to enter into the sacrificial system. There's nothing in the Old Testament about paying for this. It's really for the Jews who have come in from all around the other countries whose foreign coinage is not acceptable at the temple. So the exchange rates go on in the temple. It's like the temple of God becomes the Bank of England. You might like the idea, but Jesus didn't. And so he cats them all out. And of course, with that enigmatic phrase, you've made this into something God never intended it to be. It's become a house of robbers, when really it should be a house of prayer. And in some of those four Gospels, prayer for the healing of the nations. So Jesus is challenging the, the temple ministry to be refreshed and renewed. In Mark's Gospel, which we read today, we're told he went straight to the temple. He had a good look round and then went down to Bethany, presumably to Lazarus's house, for his night's sleep, and he's back straight away, uh, first thing in the morning, up to that temple. I don't know how you feel, but how would you feel if Jesus came to St. James's Rowledge and had a good look around? Now, I'm not trying to put negative things uh, on us, but I think it reminds us that periodically Jesus wants to come and look at the healthiness of the church. How are we doing in our grace? and favouring? How are we doing in our caring and nurturing? How are we doing with our differences of opinion and how we express them and go about them? How are we in our prayers for each other and our encouraging of each other? All those practical ways so that we're trying to grow each other into the way that God wants us to be. This theme is in fact repeated in the last book in the Bible where we see Jesus coming to all seven churches and inspecting them, does an audit on them, if you like, seeing what they're good at and praising that and looking at what needs fixing and challenging that. I think, you know, we should take Palm Sunday as God's wake-up call to us, not for introspection, not to look for the bad guys and say, if only you weren't like you are, we'd be a much better place, but to say, Lord, renew us in your spirit. And if we're like that as we journey through Lent, especially come this Palm Sunday day, I think we will be pleasing the heart of the Saviour, who amidst all the clamour of the crowd and the adulation, which I know is like a burst bubble come Thursday, but if we renew the way we share ministry within the Church of God, then his Palm Sunday visit has achieved what it wants. Part of my work over the last 20 years has been working with churches who have registered difficulties in their growth and help them find ways to break through deadlocks, to bring reconciliation where needed or mediation where possible. But all with the same goal of wanting to renew the life uh, of that church. I'll tell you just one because I, I would love to share many with you. But I was invited by Pete Dickinson, who is the Dean of the Cathedral of St. Luke and St. Paul in Charleston in South Carolina, to come and run this process 
I lead called To Restore. His church was actually under scaffolding. Um, it was experiencing some kind of wet rot in the brickwork and the estimates was running into millions of dollars. The church congregation felt under a heavy pull and had done for some time and Pete wanted to find a way through this. And as we worked together, looking at the story of the life of this church in outline, he reminded me that it had been built by black slave labour and the self-same slaves were made to sit up in the balcony during Sunday morning services and were not allowed to take Holy Communion if they took it at all, but certainly not alongside the white owners that were there. And when I arrived, there was only one black person in the entire congregation, and he was the janitor, a man called Anthony, who hardly ever spoke. And when we come to, to the final piece of blessing the church, uh, somebody came up to me and said, we're going to ask Anthony to lead the prayers around the grounds because he's the janitor. And I challenged them saying, why are you repeating the sins of history? I know your heart is good, but white people have been telling black people what they can and cannot do in this church for hundreds of years. Why don't you ask him what God's laid on his heart? Treat him as an equal. And they did. And this is what he said. He said, I really find it hard to speak. And when I come to services on Sunday, I hear my ancestors screaming up in the balcony with their pain and protest. So me, he said, I want to go up in that balcony. Incidentally, where all the wet rot was concentrated. I want to go up there and ask God if he'll forgive us, the church, for what we did to them. Not I'm a black person. I'm siding with them in my history. No, this is my church. Its story is my story. So I'm going up into that balcony, he said, and ask God to forgive us, the church, for the sins of the church. And lots of people went with him. It turned it to be a turning point in the life of that church. And as a spin-off, and maybe this is just entirely coincidental or God-related, but Pete said, when they came to complete the wet rot work, the wet rot had disappeared. It was actually needed repointing, and that was considerably cheaper. On Palm Sunday, Jesus's prime focus was to come to the temple and say, this is not how you're supposed to be. This is supposed to be a place of prayer. And he challenges them. He doesn't rubbish the temple because we're told he later on is teaching in the temple courts. So take from this Palm Sunday a challenge, perhaps, to say, Lord, on Palm Sunday or any time you want, come and renew us, your church, to be the church you want us to be. Thirdly and finally, in the Palm Sunday agenda of Jesus, it's a wake-up call for the community or the city. Isn't it interesting, in Matthew's version of Palm Sunday, we're told this, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this that's coming into our town? Who is it? That word stirred is interesting. It occurs almost exclusively in Matthew's Gospel. And you won't be surprised to know that it's the same word that's used when the wise men come to Herod and said, we're looking for him who was born king, not born to be king, born king of the Jews. And the Bible records in Matthew, Herod and all the city with him was troubled and stirred. The Greek word is seo, and we get it from the same word as seismic, cosmic, uh, if you like. Um, it's the word used for the earthquakes that happened when Jesus died in the dark upon the cross. It's to do with riotous excitement. It's not a tame word. So the city has a sense of waking up to, who is this who's come amongst us? It's like Rowley saying, who is this Jesus that we sense is here uh, amongst us? It's a very strong and powerful word. Only Luke's gospel records the fact that Jesus stopped outside the city before he went in through the gates. And as he's coming down from the Hill of Olives, Paths Gethsemane Garden, where I know some of you have been on pilgrimage because I had the privilege of being with you at that time. As you come down and you see the outline of the city and its walls, 
he pauses and comes out with what's called a lament. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, oh, you who stone the prophets, how I've longed to gather you into my heart, says God, like a hen chicken does her chicks. But you wouldn't have it that way, and you'll not be able to know God's love until you recognize and be able to say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. It's such a challenge that Jesus brings to the city. Many commentators wonder what it's about. I think personally, Jesus is summarizing the lifestyle of this community, very simply put perhaps, but still longing for it to change the way it behaves as a community and be brought into a better knowledge of the love of God and to be embraced by that love. I do wonder, you know, if this could be described as the first ever prayer walk. OK, done on the back of a colt and a donkey, but just the same. He's surveying the city, seeing what goes on amongst it, and his heart cry is for its healing. I have a friend of mine called Lloyd Cook, who is a, a Baptist pastor in Stoke-on-Trent. Very gifted man who for many years now has been the inspiration behind uniting churches of all different denominations to engage in acts of care and ministry amongst the five towns of Stoke-on-Trent. I remember being asked to preach at the mayoral banquet one year uh, when leaders, both church-wise and community-wise, civic and political, all came into the major town hall and I had the privilege of speaking. But there was a little presentation before I did and basically it was a secular survey commissioned by the churches to answer one simple question. If the Church of Jesus Christ was to stop all its social action and care in the community, everything, and just be retreat, as it were, to the building of the church, what would it cost the town council to cover the same events financially? And this independent assessor worked out that for Stoke-on-Trent, it would be then £300 million. To which Lloyd Cook turned to the politicians and social activists and says, we don't share this with you to boast, but we share this with you to say you need us. It's time you respected our contribution. And so we're ever so pleased to have this engagement with you. I know that St. James's is engaged in its community in so many different ways. And part of Jesus's Palm Sunday call is to look at the town or the community in which we live and see what needs celebrating and do so and see what needs healing and ask God, how can we be a resource for the renewing and healing of our community so that it reflects the Palm Sunday Jesus, the Easter Sunday Christ moving about amongst us. So this Palm Sunday, may God inspire us all to seek the renewal of our church and to engage in sharing in the community of which we are a part that same love of Christ to transform and transfigure what it is to live together under the Easter light. Amen. And so let us declare our faith in God, who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. 
On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He, is, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And so as people of prayer, Tony's going to lead us in our intercessions. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for sending your son and paving the way for our lives to be set free through Jesus' death on the cross. Thank you for what this day, Palm Sunday, stands for, the beginning of Holy Week, the start of the journey towards the power of the cross, the victory of the resurrection and the rich truth that Jesus is King of Kings and Saviour for the world. Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. God the Son humbled himself, taking on human flesh, suffering and dying in our place. We pray to God our Father and place in his hands the suffering of the world. We pray for the church, your people, that we may humbly bear our crosses and follow Jesus as our Lord and King. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we call to mind the Easter story, we think of the priests and scribes. So we pray for our archbishop, bishops, priests and lay ministers, entrusted with your holy word. May they preserve the truth of your word and teach, live and share the power of your word. In particular, we pray that the signposts video telling the true story of Easter, which goes out to all schools in the Farnham area, will stir hearts and minds of our young people and inspire them to want to find out more about the truth of your love for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we think of Peter, we pray for all of us, all who have sinned. Teach us to be sorry for our sins and forgive us for all that we do wrong. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we think of Barabbas, we pray for prisoners and criminals that they may find true freedom by changing the way they live. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we think of Pilate and Herod, we pray for all in government, especially at this difficult time as we move through the pandemic. May they use their power properly and serve truth and justice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we think of the thieves crucified with Jesus, we pray for those who are dying. May they die with Jesus by their side too and be received into your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we think of Mary, we pray for parents who have suffered loss with the death of a child. May they bear their suffering and know the true comfort of your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the world and especially those affected in areas of the world where there is hardship or unrest, war, conflict. And we pray for the charities and agencies working to bring peace. Today we've been asked to pray for the work of Grassroots Trust, Food Bank and the Church Army. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for those known to us personally with special needs this week. And now we name them silently in our hearts. Father, may the suffering and death of our Lord Jesus lighten the burden of all who suffer. 
lead us in the way of the cross, that as we suffer with Jesus, so we may rise to life in his glory, for he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit. And finally, from the church family cycle of prayers, this week we pray for Patricia and Mike Dean, Ruth Dixon, Elizabeth Dixon and Delia Doland. Thank you that your ways are far greater than our ways, your thoughts far deeper than our thoughts. Thank you that as we think and pray this Easter week, thank you that you had a plan to fulfil. Thank you that you make all things new. Thank you that you are always beside us. You know our hearts and hear our prayers. Help us to not follow after the voice of the crowds, but to press in close to you, to hear your whispers and to seek after you alone. We praise you, we bless you, Lord, and we thank you that you reign supreme now and forever. Amen. As we prepare to receive Holy Communion here in church and in our own homes, we're going to sing our next hymn together. So with bread and wine laid before us, Jesus, true vine and bread of life, ever giving yourself that the world might live, let us share your death and passion. Make us perfect in your love. Amen. The Lord be with you 
and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For as the time of his passion and resurrection draws near, the whole world is called to acknowledge his hidden majesty. The power of the life-giving cross reveals the judgment that has come upon the world and the triumph of Christ crucified. He is the victim who dies no more, the lamb once slain who lives forever, our advocate in heaven to plead our cause, exalting us there to join with the angels and archangels, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. All glory be to you, our heavenly Father, who in your tender mercy gave your only Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. He instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. Hear us, merciful Father, we humbly pray, and grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we receiving these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper he took the, the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them saying, drink this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Therefore, Lord and Heavenly Father, in remembrance of the precious death and passion, the mighty resurrection and glorious ascension of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, we offer you through him this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Grant that by his merits and death and through faith in his blood, we and your whole church may receive forgiveness of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. Although we are unworthy, through our manifold sins, to offer you any sacrifice. Yet we pray that you will accept this, the duty and service that we owe. Do not weigh our merits, but pardon our offences, and fill us all who share in this Holy Communion with your grace and heavenly blessing. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, Almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread.
And so in our homes as the community of faith, we draw near with faith. We receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he has given for us. We eat and drink it in remembrance that he died for us. And we feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Having received this simple meal, we pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, you humbled yourself in taking the form of a servant and in obedience died on the cross for our salvation. Give us the mind to follow you and to proclaim you as Lord and King to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Faithful God, 
May we who share this banquet glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, our salvation, our life and our hope, who reigns as Lord now and forever. Amen. We sing together our final hymn. Thank you so much for joining us for this service of Holy Communion today as we go into the week ahead, Holy Week, as we journey from Palm Sunday towards the cross of Good Friday and as we continue through death and into the resurrection life of Easter morning. Let me pray a prayer of blessing over us. Christ, give you the grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves and to take up your cross to follow him. And as you do so, may you know the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit with you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>